Hey, do you guys remember when we were all pissed at Kucherov for not trying during the All-Star game? Well, last week he just put up 10 points, 5 power play points in only 4 games, and he now sits number 1 in the NHL at 136 points in 76 games. You've got McKinnon with 131 in 77, and McDavid in third, 130 points in 74 games. So he could come back and try to make a push, but this race will come down to the wire, and so too will the race for the final spots in the Eastern Conference playoffs, which is something you want to pay attention to in your fantasy matchups. And speaking of our fantasy matchups, those are probably also going to go down to the wire as we're now facing the best competition in our leagues as we enter in the final week of the regular season or our fantasy playoffs. Now, full disclosure, my week 25 matchups were anything but tight, and I'm set to lose about three out of four, potentially all four, but I'm up in the main THHL league that I'm in, which begs the question, why are you guys even watching this video if I'm that bad? But take my recommendations with a grain of salt. But with that said, let's jump into the final week of the regular season and check out the schedule. Now this quote unquote week goes all the way until Thursday of next week, which is April 8th to the 18th, which is 10 total days. So in that span, there are 76 games. That's a crazy amount of games. And the light nights are the usual Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. But there are a few that are semi-light. As you can see here, there's a Friday with five. There's Monday and Tuesday with eight. Those aren't crazy busy. And then this Thursday, the last day of the regular season has six. So there's a number of different ways to play the schedule, but you still probably only have your four standard uh, player ads for the week. So four ads spread out over 10 days. You're probably not going to want to make one of those complicated schedule plays. You're probably going to want to pick up a player from one of these better teams with the schedules and then ride them all week. So uh, for that purpose, here's the teams up at the top here. Six games for Edmonton and Vegas, four light nights. Uh, you could potentially count the rest of these as light nights as well. So Vegas has the perfect schedule every other night, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. Um, you know, they could play on this Wednesday. That would be a little bit more preferable, but look at the competition that they face in the back half of the week. So this is a really nice setup. We're going to go over the Vegas ads in this video. With Edmonton, they have the first two days off. So what I was going to suggest is that you could pick up a Toronto Maple Leaf for this first two game stretch, then pick up an Edmonton Oiler for this three game stretch, get five games in the front half and then the three games in the back half. Uh, you can still do that if you want, but I'm probably going to, uh, you know, just in the process of putting this video together, there's not a lot on the wire for Edmonton Oilers, and you're probably going to want to grab them early in the week so that nobody else in your league does. So with that said, you can also go to Toronto. They have uh, a six game week with a, l a couple fewer uh, light nights. They play the Devils Tuesday and Thursday. They play Saturday. So they do have this Monday, but it's Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday for the rest of this week. And then a couple games here that are going to be very tight and contentious. Uh, you've got Florida and then Tampa Bay on the road back to back. So you will see Joseph Wall a couple times. We'll get into that in a little bit. Then you've got Calgary and Seattle with six games and they're playing, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, you got a Saturday here for the Kraken, um, but there are a couple opportunities to get them in, and there's some opportunities for some goal scoring with some of these teams. You can see Calgary playing San Jose, playing Anaheim, you've got uh, Arizona there that could give up some goals, and then San Jose again to close it out. So this could be an opportunity to pick up some uh, Calgary Flames, even though they're not necessarily in the best spot in terms of how they've been playing since the trade deadline. But these are your six game teams. Then you've also got a couple of teams with five games, but a couple of light nights. So you've got the Pittsburgh Penguins who are fighting for a playoff spot. You definitely want to pay attention to that. They've got Monday, Thursday, Saturday, and then Monday and Wednesday. So, uh, you know, not as many games, maybe a little bit less preferable, but all of these games mean something to the Penguins and they're going to have to play well. And don't look now, but Alex Nedeljkovic is on a heater. We'll get into that in the goaltending section of this video. Now, further down, you've got Arizona. They also have a bunch of light night games. Uh, you can see here the back to back here, Tuesday, Wednesday. They've got this Friday, they got Sunday and Wednesday. So every one of their games is a light night game. So if you have a bunch of guys that are playing Tuesday, Thursday, Saturdays, you could potentially just add guys from the Coyotes and kind of, you're not gonna get the same game volume in terms of getting you know every one of these games up here at the top, but you're gonna get all those light nights, which is gonna be really nice as you move throughout your week. Then you've also got uh, Vancouver down here. They've got a decent schedule, five games, three light nights. You've got this Monday, Wednesday, and then all the way over here. This Tuesday is not that light, but this one, 
Uh, Thursday's a little bit lighter, so depending on how you classify a light night, they do have a lot of games spread out, so they're not playing back-to-backs, which is good, but Casey DeSmith is maybe not ownable at this point, so that is a troubling development. Hopefully, you can get Demko back if you have him, and then you also have the Chicago Blackhawks. There are a couple of players that we've talked about in the previous weeks that you're going to want access to, and there's one guy in this week uh, that we're going to look at in detail, but Before we do any of that, let's get into the best schedule this week, and that is the Vegas Golden Knights. Now, Thomas Hurdle practiced in a regular jersey as uh, early as April 2nd, and he's been practicing. He didn't make the trip over the weekend, so he didn't get in in week 25. He may get in some point in week 26, and I would imagine they want to get him in to try to acclimate him to the team and get him back healthy, ready to go for the playoffs, as opposed to Mark Stone, who's not going to be back before playoffs. So... Thomas Hurdle, 37% owned. He's maybe not the having the best season, 34 points in 48 games, but he is one of those guys that you know usually is on the waiver wire and can produce in you know stretches for you, especially coming over to a team like this, probably getting inserted in the top six and on the power play. So that would be an option for you. But if you're looking for somebody who's red hot right now, William Carlson, 53% owned, nine points in a six game point streak. One of those on the power play, three goals, six assists. He's been really productive over the last little bit. But then if you're looking for uh, peripherals, now this is one of those areas where you're going to get the six games and they're all spread out really nicely. So you're going to get an opportunity for volume. And if you're looking for volume, Braden McNabb, 2.67 hits per game, 2.83 blocks per game over his last six games. And he's got two assists in that span as well. He's 30% owned. Every defenseman in Vegas likes to block shots. They're forced to block shots by Bruce Cassidy, so any of them could be good for blocks, but for hits and blocks, Braden McNabb is probably your best bet. For just hits, down at the bottom here, Keegan Kolasar, he's been averaging 4.08 hits per game over the last month, so it's been going on for a while now, and that is encouraging to see. As we take a look at his player hub, you can see he's extremely good in hits, 98th percentile at 3.48 hits per game, And for the last month, he's been averaging half a hit per game more than that. So 2% owned, single position right winger. He's going to be your big volume hitter from Vegas this week. Then if you're looking for a deep league offensive play, Anthony Mantha has been quietly putting up some good numbers since coming over to Vegas. Eight points in his last seven games, 13 hits to go along with that, which he wasn't doing when he was playing uh, in the other places that he's played, basically in Detroit and Washington. He wasn't hitting a lot despite his size, but he has been hitting... Uh, almost two hits per game over the last seven. And then he's got those eight points in those seven games. He's getting an opportunity here, 83rd percentile in goals. The power play numbers are probably from, um, you know, the sample size that he had in Washington a little bit on PP2, but maybe he's going to get a little bit of power play time over the next six games plus as they try to gear up for the playoffs. And they do have some opponents here that give up goals. So, you know, the back end, you're looking at Chicago and Anaheim down there. They give up goals and hopefully... You're going to get access to Anthony Mantha, hopefully scoring some of those goals. He only has two goals in his last seven games, but he is getting some assists as well. So those are some options for you looking at the Vegas situation. Now, in terms of goaltending, I haven't heard anything about um, Aiden Hill. So it looks like Logan Thompson is going to play and he might play. I doubt they'll give him every one of these games. So you're probably going to look at Yuri Patera on the waiver wire, but... Again, you're getting four ads this entire week for 10 days. I don't know if you want to add a goaltender who's only going to play one game, maybe two games. Probably going to want a goalie who's going to get you volume, and we'll get into that in the goaltending section. But up next, let's take a look at the other teams that you can pick from and the other team that I've been mentioning in a lot of the previous videos in terms of uh, schedule plays and in this video is Edmonton. So Edmonton has uh, a little bit less on the waiver wire to grab from. So you do have red hot Matias Ekholm at 75%, probably not there for almost anybody out there. But if for whatever reason, he's on your waiver wire, he's got 10 points in his last eight games and 18 hits. He's a hits and blocks D type you know, defenseman. He's not necessarily an offensive guy. As we pull up his player hub, you can see really good numbers in terms of goals. So 10 goals on the season, 91st percentile for defenseman, 90th percentile for assists. And then the shot volume at 2.2 shots per game is also 93rd percentile for defensemen. And you can see here from the trend graph, basically back since right around before your fantasy playoffs were starting, he's been skyrocketing in value. As you can see here, 10 points in his last eight games. That will do it. Three goals, seven assists in that span, plus those hits 
Uh, those hits are, you know, on top of his 1.77 season-long average. So not a crazy amount of blocks. The hits are better than what his season-long average has been, and the offensive production has been coming lately as well. Now, another guy that you could target if you're looking for a forward is Adam Henrique. He's centered left wing dual eligible, 27% owned, three goals, 18 hits in his last eight games. Not known as a big hitter in previous stops with New Jersey and Anaheim, but he is hitting now, playing kind of a role playing uh, type of situation in that third line center, I'm assuming, getting a little bit of exposure into the middle six. Uh, not the most productive in terms of offense, but three goals is not bad, and then those hits. So if you're in a points league that weights hits at one point per hit, and you get some extra weighting for goals, this could be a play for you. 1.22 hits per game on the season, and he's been above that over his last eight games, so that is nice to see. He just doesn't get the same deployment, and you're not getting a lot of power play time out of Henrique. Obviously, that number one unit is all owned up, and all of the top guys are pretty much owned up. And so is probably Evander Kane. I can't imagine him being available in many different leagues, but 64% owned means he's there for you, maybe in a 10-teamer or an 8-team league. Two goals, eight shots, six hits in his last three games. You can see here, 3.19 hits per game average on the season, 2.88 shots per game. So you're getting him for the hits and shots floor and then hoping to get some goals. But you can see the trend back from December all the way till now. Back in December, they had some injuries and McDavid wasn't playing great, so Evander Kane was actually carrying them a little bit in that stretch, and he was up to an 85 in his completeness rating, now down to below a 75. So it's been a slow, steady decline, which could explain his ownership, but uh, with that said, he is known for his shots and hitting and goal scoring. So if you just need those three things and you're in a shallow league, you could go for Kane. If you're in a deep league, the only guy that I have for you here is Ryan McLeod. You could go Corey Perry, but McLeod is getting top six deployment, or sorry, middle six deployment. Uh, line three with Carey, Kane and Perry. Um, funny. <laughs> but anyways, um, he's line three and power play two. Two assists last week. Nothing crazy there, but 1% owned. He looks fast, he looks like he's engaged, and they're gonna need some depth scoring down the stretch. They do have a couple of back-to-backs here, and there is an opportunity for some scoring against Arizona, San Jose, Arizona again. There are some tough teams with some better defenses in there as well, so hopefully they can get McLeod going in a week like this. If you're in a 20-team league and you need somebody, Ryan McLeod could be that guy for you. But that's gonna do it for our look at the Edmonton Oilers. Up next, we'll take a look at a team that I haven't really looked at a lot this season because it's kind of like Edmonton. A lot of their main guys are owned up and you're not getting a lot of exposure on the wire, and that is the Toronto Maple Leafs. But uh, a couple of things have started to develop. So Tyler Bertuzzi, seven goals, three assists, 10 points in his last 12 games, just a shade under a point per game, finally getting going as the playoffs roll into uh, you know the middle of April here now. So he's a playoff performer. He did that last year, which is why he got the contract. So as we get closer to NHL playoffs, he's been heating up a little bit. He's on the top line with Austin Matthews and Max Domi. Of the two, Bertuzzi is definitely better than Domi. Uh, if you do want exposure to Matthews, Domi could get you that as well, but he just is a little bit less prolific when it comes to the metrics that you're gonna look for. You also have Matthew Nyes, 9% owned. Both of these are single position left wingers, but Nyes with seven points in his last six games above a point per game, and he's got 2.16 hits per game in that span as well, which is something that I didn't really expect to see uh, as we take a look at his player hub. Before we do, here's Bertuzzi. You can see here kind of stable across the board, 1.2 hits per game, a couple blocks, a couple shots, nothing crazy in any one category, but pretty solid across the board, and he's been improving since uh, the playoffs, fantasy playoffs started around 317. That's kind of when people were starting their fantasy playoffs, and he's been producing since then. But then you also have Matthew Nyes down here. He's got 2.12 hits per game on the season, so hitting right around that range over his last six games and increasing the production offensively seven points in his last six. You could potentially go Bobby McMahon as well. Uh, you're getting the same amount of hits, uh, close to the same amount of shots and a little bit more goal scoring so 15 goals on the year for McMahon he scores in bunches he had that hat trick earlier in the year um, and you're not getting a lot of assists and almost no power play time or blocks out of him so of the the group there you're probably looking at Bertuzzi as your best ad maybe Nye's second and then McMahon third but if you're just looking for volume and you should be in a six game week for Toronto Simone Benoit has been hitting everything that moves uh, 
he's one of those guys not as complete. You can see way down here at a 38, but 3.79 hits per game on the season, 99th percentile there. And that's his season long average. His average over the last two weeks is 5.17 hits per game, which is crazy. And then he's still blocking shots on top of that 1.67 blocks in that span. He's only 6% owned. And of the two, if you look at McCabe down here, 4.14 hits per game and 1.57 blocks. Now McCabe does do other things occasionally. He did quarterback the power play a little bit in the absence of Morgan Riley when he was out for suspension. Three hits per game average on the season for McCabe, getting 1.8 blocks on the season, and he's got some goals, seven goals on the year, but he's been pretty consistently flat, uh, basically back since, where is this, around January. He took a little bit of a bump up in the right direction into mid-February, but he's pretty much been stable around here, uh, and he's a 32% owned. So of the two of them, if you're just looking for hits and blocks, I would definitely go Benoit, uh, as he's you know a little bit easier to own at 6%. And he's been killing it over the past couple of weeks. But there's a couple different options for you there. Uh, if, for whatever reason, Liljegren is back, he's also been averaging close to four or above four hits per game over his last two weeks or so. Uh, and he was getting some blocks and he was quarterback in the power play, scoring a couple of points in that span when he was doing so. But I heard a report that he may not be back until the last two games before the playoffs, which are these two. And if you're not going to get him for the entire uh, season or the entire week of the season, then you might as well just pick up one of these guys. But that's going to do it for our look at these teams in particular. Up next, we're going to take a look at some trending players. Now, before we get into the normal trending segment, I do have something to show you guys. Some of the guys that have been improving week over week for the last two weeks in a row. All right, so what we're looking at here are players who have improved between the 24th and the 31st and from the 31st to this previous or this Sunday, actually. So the last two weeks, have they improved each week? Uh, and this is a much smaller list than what you would expect. There's not a lot of guys who have been consistently performing like that. And this is filtered out to guys who have changed uh, and gone up at least two points in their completeness rating. So with that said, the guys in red over here are guys who have uh, four game weeks. If they're white, they have a five game week. If it's green, they have a six game week or a five game week with a number of light nights. So with all that said, one of the guys that sticks out here is Seth Jones at the top. He's been improving each of these two weeks. He's at now close to an 83. Uh, when you round up, he's at an 82.43. He's only 65% owned. So he is available in some shallow leagues and he's been a guy that's been getting a ton of shot volume, getting some power play points and playing really well uh, as they got Bedard back and basically since then he's been ownable in fantasy which is a nice uh, thing if you're in a shallow league and you need access to a power play quarterback defenseman. Now a little bit further down um, do want to give a shout out to John Carlson he's been improving every single week over the last I don't know two and a half months uh, he's been much much better than the first half of the season but he's obviously owned up. Wierenski is another guy who's been killing it lately he would be uh, factoring in in terms of the top 25 players of the week as I believe he had two goals three assists he had a two goal uh, one assist game yesterday which helped out a lot of our discord members so he's another guy that's been getting it done another power play quarterback defenseman that you could potentially add if he's available Ekholm is on this list as well we mentioned him earlier on but a guy we haven't touched on is Slavkovsky he's been really good he's been over a point per game you can see down here 14 points in his last 13 games. He's 28% owned. Uh, and again, they do have a five game week, I believe. So this is not necessarily the best schedule, but it's not a bad schedule. And he's on that top line with Suzuki and Caulfield. They've been really good over the last two weeks. And you can tell here he's been improving every week, uh, basically going a little bit further back than this. Uh, and you can tell that he's been playing really good hockey basically for about a month with this over a point per game average in that span. So he would be another guy you could add if you have uh, a couple of other ads to use, there's a, guy, a couple guys with lower ownership percentages. You got Monahan here at 29%. Um, you have Sorelli, who is now day to day. I picked him up. The, that was the wrong play. Apparently, Nick Paul was the play. He played really well this week. And my opponent in one of my leagues, uh, I believe the Creators League, had Stamkos and Nick Paul. And he you know, had incredible goaltending performances. So I got absolutely destroyed. But Sorelli was playing really well in the week before that, and if he is healthy, he is a middle six centerman. 
who's getting a little bit of special teams time. William Eklund has been a nice story as well. Uh, as I pull up his numbers, he's got five goals, five assists in his last eight games, including a hat trick the other night. So that is really nice to see. He is dual position eligible, which is also nice to see. And he's on San Jose, so nobody wants him. Um, they do have a five game week. So that is uh, one of the reasons why he may or may not work for you, depending on you know how you factor that in. But anybody on that San Jose Sharks team that's playing in the top six and getting power play time, you could get access to pretty easily. I picked up Granlin over the weekend. He helped me out a little bit, but obviously not enough to win my matchup. Then you've got Pacioretty down here. He is 8% owned. He's available. Caden Gooley's playing pretty well. He increased some of the most out of anybody on this list. You can see 4.65 point increase. Now a 65 on the hub. And you can tell Montreal's using some of their younger players and starting to get other guys involved as they close out their season. Here you have Alex Kerfoot. Uh, for Arizona, they've got the, uh, I believe, five games, but a bunch of light nights, which we mentioned earlier on. Uh, he's improved over three points over the past two weeks, and he's only 5% owned, so he could be another play for you. Down here is Mantha. Uh, he, we talked about him before. And then here's a guy that we're going to talk about in this segment, Matty Beneers. I'll get to his file in just a second, but just wanted to highlight him here. You also have Connor Garland. Uh, he could be an option for you if you have, uh, you know, if you want that exposure to Pedersen or JT Miller, whoever they're going to put Garland with in the top six. Uh, he's 25% owned and a couple of 1% guys down here at the bottom. I believe this list is closed out by Pustinen and Pew Suter, another Vancouver Canuck that you could potentially add at 2% and 0% respectively. But now let's get into the rest of the guys that we didn't mention here. We'll start it off with Andre Kuzmenko. Four goals, five assists, nine points in a five-game point streak. Four of those points coming on the power play, so he's getting some power play time. Power play numbers are pretty strong at 83rd percentile there, uh, which has been inflated by this five-game point streak. Same too with the goals and the assists coming. Um, he's been a little bit better. He was uh, pretty good when he started coming over for Calgary. Then he went through a stretch where he was on the fourth line, not getting a lot of time. But he's kind of re uh, evolved his game a little bit, and he, now he's playing on the top line uh, with Nazem Kadri and Pospisil. So that could be, um, you know, something to monitor. He may not be there all week, but as he's there now, and he is dual position eligible, left wing, right wing. He's only 39% owned, so he's probably there for you in a shallow league, 12-teamer. Um, he would be one of the better options since, as I mentioned, Calgary has a six-game week and a couple of easier opponents in that stretch. So this could be a nice play if you're looking for goals and some power play exposure. Now, another guy that I talked about last week, uh, Brian Rust, he kind of cooled off just a little bit in the last couple of games, but he was red hot to start the week, and he is still one of the best options from Pittsburgh. He's 53% owned, so he's probably not there for you in some 12-team leagues, but 10-team leagues, he's probably there. Five goals, five assists, 10 points in his last eight games, two of those on the power play. Obviously, that power play is uh, not necessarily going to feature him. It's going to feature all the usual suspects, and Evgeny Malkin has been playing really well lately as well. But Brian Rust giving you top six exposure, giving you Crosby exposure, which is exactly what you want. And as I mentioned, Pittsburgh is in a fight to the death to try to make the playoffs. They're going to need all their top guys playing at their best over the next couple games. You're not going to see them load managing these guys. So that is something to worry about in week 26 is who's going to get benched for load management. You have guys like Rantanen who's gotten hurt. So if you're trying to fill those, those holes, you could potentially go out and find Brian Rust uh, on your waiver wire. 53%, he would be a really good add for a team that desperately needs guys like him to score. Now, speaking of that team, you're also looking at Michael Bunting. Uh, he would be a little bit uh, further down on the list for me in terms of Penguins adds, but seven points in his last eight games is nothing to sneeze at. Two goals, five assists in that span, and a power play point. I would figure he would be the net front guy on that power play, the second power play unit maybe, getting occasional first line minutes, but um, single position left wing, so that is going to factor in as well. Um, Pittsburgh does have a couple of light night games. That's why they're featured here, five games total, three light night games. So um, you may not have to worry about the dual position eligibility with either of these guys from Pittsburgh. Now, if you have room for a center, Matty Beneers has started to play, finally, uh, a little bit better than he was earlier in the season. So, excellent season in his rookie year. Sophomore slump hit him pretty hard this year. But in his last seven games, four goals, two assists, six points, three power play points. And as we mentioned earlier, Seattle does have a six-game week. Uh, and this could be another volume play for you. So, 
You can see his trend here going from the 24th, he rocketed up from a 56 to a 59, now up to a 60. The power play numbers have come up because of uh, you know three power play points in his last seven games. Other than that, he's been pretty steady across the board, right around half a point per game. Nothing crazy there on the season. Not gonna hit a lot, not gonna get a lot of shot blocks, but if you're looking for somebody from Seattle, there's probably, uh, McCann is probably owned up. Um, you could try Beneers, but there's a couple of other guys that you could try from Seattle as well. So if you're looking for uh, hits, Ellie Tolvanen is probably your guy because of the fact that he's not just gonna hit. So 2.6 hits per game on the year, 94th percentile in blocks from a forward as well. He was as high as an 83 on the completeness rating. He's down to a 78, but that's because some of the offense had dried up. The hitting has stayed pretty consistent over that stretch, and he's up to 3.14 hits per game in the last seven. So five points in that span, a goal, four assists. The offense has come back a little bit. He is dual position eligible, so if that matters to you, it would probably be between Kuzmenko, Tolvanen, and Sharon Govich, who we'll get into in just a minute in terms of positional flexibility. But if you're looking for completeness and hits uh, with a couple of blocks thrown in there, Tolvanen could be your guy. If you're looking for goal scoring, uh, Bjorkstrand, we've mentioned him before on the channel in weeks where we're looking at Seattle Kraken, 27% owned, single position right winger, six points in his last seven games, two goals, four assists, three of those on the power play. His power play numbers are very good especially for a team like this where you're getting the six game week and uh, you have exposure to their top power play unit, which is not always the case when you have a six game week like this. You can tell uh, you're not getting exposure to Toronto's power play. You're not getting exposure to Edmonton's. You can get Seattle's and you could probably also get, uh, you know, Kuzmenko or somebody else off of Calgary. So for Bjorkstrand, 94th percentile in terms of power play points, 24 on the year. That's really good. And he's got 20 goals on the season as well. So that's not bad at all. Uh, he's been one of the more consistent producers over the entire season, so he's uh, one of your stable plays this week. Now, as I just mentioned, Sharon Govich, he scored, uh, I believe he had two last night. Um, I was watching that Edmonton game. That was absolutely bonkers for the first two periods. Uh, I went to bed. I didn't see the third, but it was pretty much I needed a win from Markstrom, and that was not to be. So uh, Sharon Govich did his part, though. Two goals, three assists, five points in his last four games, and all five of those points coming on the power play. So that is what you like to see. You also like to see this 94th percentile goal number as he just hit 30 goals last night. That is really, really good for a guy that they traded Tyler Toffoli to the Devils for, and Toffoli ends up moving on to Winnipeg. So the Devils didn't even keep him, and the Flames get Sharon Govich and a 30-goal scorer out of that. That's a nice bit of business for the Calgary Flames, and he is three-position eligible, which is very rare in fantasy, so he will get into your lineup no matter what because you can move him around so much, so this would be a really good add. The only thing I'll say about him is he's somewhat streaky as a goal scorer. I seem to time it bad when he's red hot. I pick him up, and then he goes cold, so take that for, with a grain of salt, but uh, streaky goal scorer over six games, he probably will do something this week, so you can get access to him at 33% ownership. And last but not least, we did mention Slavkoski. We'll just look at his file really quickly as he's been playing really good hockey. You can see down at a 49, a little bit below a 50 back in December, he is now a 76, so incredibly complete now compared to earlier in the season, and the offense has been really nice. So 11 assists in 13 games, 14 points in that span, and power play points to go along with that. So 81st percentile in power play, 14 power play points on the year. Getting some blocks, 1.83 hits per game is also nice that he's using that size that he has. And then you also have uh, some assist numbers here. Uh, 29 assists on the season in 76 games is not bad either. So this is a play where you're getting the top line exposure in Montreal, and th that line has been very good. Nick Suzuki's been great all season long. You have Caulfield, who's been scoring lately uh, in your fantasy playoffs when it matters the most, and then you get Slavkovsky on top of that feeding them the puck and working with them in the offensive zone and getting some power play time. So these are some options for you. Up next, we'll take, take another look at the goaltending and we'll do kind of a similar thing where we look at the goaltenders who have been trending up over the past two weeks. So up next, what you're seeing here is the same type of thing. Goaltenders who have played well for the last couple of weeks 
in a row. So one of the guys that we have to start with is Alex Nedeljkovic. Jari's been in and out of the lineup or basically just out of the lineup and they've given the net to Nedeljkovic. Now that is important because they're in a playoff hunt. They desperately need wins. And you also have basically their starter who's available on the waiver wire. So 24% owned. He's increased 10 points on the goalie hub up to almost a 60 now. And you can see that from his trend. You can go from 47 down here right before the playoffs started, your fantasy playoffs that is, and now he's up to a 59. So if you grabbed him here and you've held him on until this point, you're probably in the finals or won your championship because he's been incredibly good for that stretch. Now, he's 1.8 above expected. The team defense is about middle of the pack. He does have a shutout. He's a 907 with a 2.8 goals against. None of these are bad. They're all pretty decent. And the volume is not going to be that high because obviously Jari was their quote unquote starter, if not their 1A. So with all that considered, you know, the fact that he's a 60 on the goaltending hub is pretty good. And you're probably not going to find another starter available on the wire as you look for somebody to fill in some goaltending starts for you in your finals. So Nedeljkovic is your number one ad this week as you're looking for goaltending. Um, but another, a couple of other guys that you can look for, Semyon Varlamov. The Isles don't play that many games, and I don't know if they have any back-to-backs off the top of my head. I'll have to double-check that, but Varlamov played pretty well last week. Uh, I mentioned him in the video last week, and then he came back with a couple of decent performances and skyrocketed from a 47 up to a 57. So this is he's now 7.1 above expected, despite the fact that the Islanders are not as good defensively as they used to be. 916 save percentage, 2.7 goals against. They too are looking for a playoff berth. They desperately need wins and they haven't been getting them. Uh, and there was a stretch there where Sorokin lost seven or eight in a row. So they needed Varlamov and they may need him again, even if they don't have any you know, back-to-backs or a ton of games. So this is something to keep an eye on as well. Uh, they have a five game week, so that's not the lowest, it's not the highest, and hopefully he would get a start or two. But that is the thing to keep in mind is if you're only getting four player ads for 10 days, you might want to think about a goaltender like Nedeljkovic, who's going to get more than one start. Speaking of that, Peter Morazic is going to get more than one start, 28% owned. Uh, he's improved each of these weeks, but this past week he improved quite a bit. As I uh, bring up his hub, he's been well above expected for most of the season, if not all of the season. He's now too above expected which is crazy considering how many shots he's faced. So he's fa he's made 1,500 saves this season. He's been getting shelled because of the defense that he's got, a 24th percentile team defense, uh, which is obviously bottom of the league, you know, towards the bottom of the league. Uh, so you're not getting that team defense and you're not getting the best numbers raw, but you are going to get starts. He's 92nd percentile in games played and you're getting total save volume. So if you're in a points league that gets you a point per save or 6.6 .6 points per save or whatever, this could be a nice play for you. I know we have a couple of guys in our Discord group that have that, so this could be an opportunity to pick up a guy who's probably going to be the starter. They might go to Soderblom as well, but Mrazek is the 1A. At 28% ownership, he would probably be one of your better bets. Now, you do also have Blackwood here. Same type of thing where he's, he's going to get five, or there's five games. I don't know if he's going to get all of them. He would get some volume. He is going to get a ton of shots against. I'll just pull up his file just for the fun of it to show you. Uh, 1,150 saves on the season. So he hasn't started as much, but he's basically on a per game basis getting shelled almost as much as Mrazek. So if you need total saves, he's at 11% ownership. Vasilevsky's obviously owned up 97% there. If for whatever reason, Samsonov is available. Uh, you have Samsonov at 78% and you have Joseph Wall at around 44, 45%. Um, Wall will have to play two of these games. They have back-to-backs in this stretch, including a back-to-back -back in Florida at the end of the week, uh, the end of the second week, I should say. Um, but Samsonov has been steadily improving from a 31 back in February, now up to almost a 50. Uh, so still not crazy high on the hub, but it's much, much better than it was earlier on when they had to send him down to the minors. He was as low as a 22. So down at a 22 at the... You know, basically when the calendar turned to 2024, now he's up. He's kind of retaken the net as the 1A, and he is going to get you at least four games this week. Uh, so even in a week where they have six and he's, you know, they have two back-to-backs, he might be a better option than some of these guys who are in the red here who are going to get you four games or less. So just wanted to mention that here. A couple of these guys are available. You have Kakinen 
Anunin, who is available, but I believe they only have four games and maybe two light nights, but I'm not sure if they have any back-to-backs. Uh, Anunin has been really good, and I'll just take a look at his file to show you. Uh, as we've been talking about it on the channel here for at least two weeks now, he's got a 931 save percentage and a 2.3 goals against, 9.9 above expected. So, if, you know, if you're looking for one spot start and you see Anunin playing, that would be an opportunity to pick him up. Um, obviously, you see Hellebuck on this list. Bressois is another guy that I would go after if you're looking for one quality start out of somebody. So it would be between Anunin and Bressois for that uh, you know, kind of play. You could also go Stolarz. He's taken a little bit of a step backward in the last couple weeks here as I pull up his file. Still really good. 16.1 above expected. Team defense still excellent. Still playing for Florida, obviously. Uh, 922 save percentage, 2.1 goals against, really good. But that's season-long numbers. In the last couple of games, he's been a little bit worse than that. But uh, he has technically improved over each of these weeks, uh, despite minimal starting time. And then, as I mentioned with Mrazic, you do also have Soderblom down here. He's 3% owned, not necessarily going to do much in terms of, uh, you know, he's not going to get a ton of start volume, so that's not going to help you. And he's not playing for a good team, so that's not going to help you either. Uh, this would be a spot start play if they're facing somebody of the same talent level as they are, but there's nobody worse than them. So that's probably not going to be the best option for you. As you can see here, his hub is rel relatively low, if not very low. He was as high as a 52 at points, but now down at a 26. So these are the goaltenders who have been improving. Um, there have been a couple of developments. So Casey DeSmith, if you picked him up trying to replace Demko, he kind of screwed all of us over, including myself, this past week, as you can see here, going from a 55 down to a 45. So not the greatest week for Casey DeSmith. Uh, they do have a couple games this week uh, where you might want to feature him, but I just don't know how much to trust it. The team defense was excellent uh, up until this past week, and then they kind of didn't uh, do that well in the critical point of the season for you and your fantasy team. So just have to mention that you may want to stay away from DeSmith. Um, in terms of other guys, now you do have the Seattle tandem. Um, they do have a six-game week or 10 days or whatever you want to call it. Decord would be the obvious player from uh, the goaltending tandem that they have there that you would want to add. But as I check his ownership right now, here's the ownership for both goaltenders in Seattle. You've got uh, Decord at 46%. You've got Grubauer at 31%. Grubauer's got three wins in his last five games, but an 859 save percentage. This is, again, what happened last year with Grubauer where he was winning games, but he couldn't put up good numbers, and Jones was winning games and couldn't put up good numbers. I should say Jones was putting up good num or winning games and not putting up good numbers, and uh, Grubauer was just terrible. So this is kind of what Martin Jones was doing last year for Seattle. Right now, I, of the two, I would prefer to have Joey Decord, even though he's got one win in, in his last three. He's got a 942 save percentage and a 1.12 goals against. So just wanted to mention that as they do have a six game week, but that's going to do it for this video. That's going to close it out for this season. Hopefully I've helped you guys at some point. I really feel awful about, uh, you know, just the way that my teams have performed this past week. So it's really gotten on my confidence and I'm starting to question whether or not I actually can still do this. Uh, a lot of the guys that I picked up either got injured right away or had terrible weeks and I got absolutely dominated in three of my four playoff matchups. So if I did help you out, let me know in the comments section below. If you have any ideas that you want to see in our postseason coverage, things like a look back on the draft or how things uh, panned out over the course of the season, let me know in the comments below, and I'll try to focus on that over the offseason and in the next couple of weeks as we move into the uh, NHL playoffs, which should be extremely exciting. But hopefully you got something good out of at least one of my videos this year. And if you did, leave a comment down below, leave a like, and remember to subscribe. Thanks again for watching, and as always, I'll see you in the next one. Good luck with all of your matchups.